Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Print Circuit Podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the print circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. In this episode, we'll focus on advanced manufacturing technologies, specifically regarding rigid flex, HDI, and even micro HDI. We'll get into that as well. Here to join me is my good friend and industry subject matter expert, Anae Vardia, CEO of American Standard Circuits, also known as ASC. Thanks for being here, Anae. Thanks, Steph, for having me here today. Can you give the audience a brief introduction of yourself and your amazing background and experience that you bring to the table that allow many people to be successful as you collaborate with them in what uh, yourself at ASC offers? Absolutely, Steph. So I have over 35 years of experience in the printed circuit board manufacturing space. I actually started my career at, in IBM. One little fun fact, you know, as we talk about some of these newer and advanced technologies, what's really interesting is a long time ago, fairly early in my career, I actually got exposed to building boards with microvias. Because at that time, IBM had its own technology to build microvia boards. So I've known and have dealt with microvias for a very, very long time in my, in my career. I'm currently the CEO of American Standard Circuits. We are a broad-based manufacturer of a variety of different kinds of printed circuit boards, starting from rigid to flex rigid flex to metal back to RF microwave boards. And most recently, we really launched what we call our Ultra HDI line. So we're a very broad-based manufacturer of printed circuit board solutions. And I think one of the things that we really love to do is work on educating the industry. So we've obviously written a number of different books We've written four books so far. There's one which is really on the fundamentals of printed circuit boards. There's one on flex rigid flex. There's one on RF microwave. And then there's another one on thermal management. So again, if you would like to get a copy of those books, they are available as a free download on our website, www.asc-i.com. So feel free to go to that, to the free resource section, and you will certainly get an opportunity to download our books. If you would really like a hard copy, uh, shoot me an email at sales at asc-i.com, and we'll see what we can do about getting you some hard copies. That content that you share to the industry, for free even, it's amazing. It's some really great stuff. I refer to those as golden nuggets because it's really the industry best practice of what is the, the correct way to design something. So you're designing the quality into it. And it has a long-term producibility because you're collaborating with your team and how things are done and how they should be done the correct way. So from one designer that's been around for you know 30 plus years, I can't thank you enough for what you and your team has been doing and continues to do. With that said, you know, let's get right into it. So when we think about flex and rigid flex and HDI, and like you said, ultra HDI, what doesn't work today when it comes to those technologies? So first of all, it's good to talk about flex and rigid flex because that is clearly a growing marketplace. I mean, the one thing, one trend that I've noticed over the last few years is you see more and more designers attempting to design flex and rigid flex boards than ever before. So I think people are finally starting to really understand the many uses of of these kinds of circuit boards and not just constrained to the military environment. Like for many years, I mean, if you were talking about rigid flex, especially in North America, It was primarily focused on the mill aerospace sector, I would say. And today it's much more broader based than than it's ever been. I've seen applications in medical, I'm seeing applications in industrial, so I'm seeing applications in a lot of different sectors. The reality is that a lot of designers don't have a lot of experience dealing with rigid flex circuit boards. And a lot of times they're trying to apply kind of similar design rules as you might apply to build a rigid circuit board. And clearly that doesn't work, right? So I think one of the biggest things that I always tell people, and I love to tell designers is, work with the circuit board shop as you're doing your design. I can't tell you how many times we've had designs where people have thrown the design over to us and the design just plain doesn't work. And, you know, we either have to spend time with them to redesign it or it ends up being a very frustrating experience for both people to get five pieces built because typically you can build five pieces of almost anything, but you might have to manufacture a hundred to get that five, right? And so 
I think in order to reduce the frustration level and I think to have a very efficient process, I think it's critical for designers to really work with some fabricators and partner with them, right? And truly partner with them, which is one of the things that we really preach. I mean, we love to work with designers. I mean, we're we're volunteering our services to you because we don't charge you for that, right? We're doing that because ultimately we hope to be able to work with you on actually building the board. So, I mean, the whole goal is to have a, a real good synergistic solution that solves your problems, that that works for you long term. And I think that's one of the bigger issues is people are not always approaching their their fabricators. I know of an instance where we built a fairly complex circuit board, rigid flex board. It was a rigid flex. It had a metal core in it. It had RF materials. It has FR4 materials. It had thermal management materials in there. And one of our Our director of technology actually spent probably three months working back and forth with the engineer. The amazing thing about it is that board was uber complex, I would say, and we actually managed to build it the first time through because of the three months of back and forth that went about before we even got the PO on that board. I couldn't agree with you more, Nay, especially regarding communication with your supplier is key. The suppliers are a stakeholder that needs to be at the table from the very beginning of that project. As you have your kickoff meeting, the suppliers, in my opinion, and you just agreed uh, and stated that they need to be brought in early on and be a part of that team to collaborate. So you are you are setting yourself up and the team up for success downstream. And it's not just at the moment of design. It's when the transition happens to fabrication, when it happens to when it goes off to assembly. It's a fully successful ecosystem when you think about the whole thing from a bird's eye view. You nailed it. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more on that, especially with, with people throwing garbage over the fence and expecting you and American standards to save them and to save the day and hopefully turn you know this garbage into gold or make a diamond out of it. And of course, they want it yesterday and they want it cheap. Or even some cases that they're asking when you push back or you start dialoguing, then they don't, they're like, you're too much for me. I'm going to go somewhere else because I just give them an, and they don't say anything. And you end up losing the PO. Why? Because they don't want to deal with that complexity and what they feel as a, as a headache. But in reality, you are saving them. And I've had other industry colleagues on the show mention the same thing, the potential of losing POs because they're initially trying to work with that success and set that up and. I'm surprised people are still just throwing stuff over the fence the way we see it. So with that said, Ana, we know what the problems are and what they can be. What about the solutions? You started to talk a little bit about potential solutions or best practices when we think about what are the solutions. What do you think designers can implement or should be implementing as they go forward? The number one recommendation, and if people don't take anything else away from this podcast, I think the most important thing really is to partner with your PCB fabricator. Because that would be the number one best practice that I would recommend, especially as the boards become more and more complex. One of the problems with complexity, and and, you know, one of the things I like to say is, on a CAD screen, you can make anything. You can, you <laughs> exactly. can design, you can put any design together on a CAD screen. The question is, can we move it from the CAD screen to an actual realized product? Can we actually take that and, and put something together that's real? And that's where the trick in the whole thing lies, right? The other thing that I've noticed is a lot of times people come up with these designs that they've thrown over the wall and then they're saying, oh, I want a 10 day turn on this highly complex board, you know, and I think people really don't fully appreciate what it takes to manufacture some of these products, you know. I mean, you're talking about stringing together a set of 100 to 200 processes sometimes to make one of these boards. And, you know, everything has got to go right every step of the way in order for a good board to come out. And the more complex it is, the more process product interactions that exist. So again, I think, you know, the number one best practice, like I said, is working with the fabricator, really focused on trying to figure that out. I think it's it's important to try to get your material set dialed in early if you can. I mean, sometimes if you have unique material sets and you know you're going to be in a rush, 
be willing to work with your supplier and tell them, go order the material for me. I'm going to need to get this going right away. I, I know my material is locked down. Start working with the material set. Start working with the via structures, you know. Make sure you have a good understanding of the via structure is going to be coupled with the material sets. Then your fabricator can figure out like how many ounce copper material we need to order, things like that, right? What What is it going to take to build it? So I think working collaboratively with them, you can ultimately reduce the overall lead time associated with building a complex printed circuit board. And I think you just have to make sure you're choosing the right fabricator based on history, right? People that have knowledge in what you're trying to do, people that have experience in what you're trying to do. It's not always, well, they're giving me the best price. As I always say, because I learned it early on in my career, there's a price and a cost. And you have to understand and know what those differences are. And in some cases, the cheapest supplier isn't always the best supplier. And knowing your supplier, their capabilities, and having a history uh, of them or knowing about them makes a difference in in going to the right supplier. But I think you would agree with me that establishing long-term relationships is the key. It's not just the one-off PO, because I I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're in it for the long-term relationship, the multiple long-term, five, 10-year, 20-year relationship, but with your customer, not just the one-off PO, and then you're one and done, and then see ya. Because I've seen your guys' your team's efforts and it's amazing what they do. To me, that that is the key. And and I, I couldn't couldn't agree with you more on that. You know, we talked about flex and rigid flex in that. What about HDI? You know, when it comes to uh, blind, buried, and microvias as well. I I do want to, you know, talk a little bit of that, especially with the ultra HDI, which is the new hot thing that, that I shouldn't say new, but it's because it's been in the chip world. Now it's being evolved into the PCB. What what do you what can you give me on that? A lot of the same principles apply in those technologies, right? I mean, HDI has been done now for quite a long time. That's where I think it's important to make sure that as you're starting the discussion, that the VIA structure is very clear because complexities start to increase as the VIA structure changes, right? So for example, if you've got three plating cycles that are going to end up on a single layer and you're trying to do a a very fine space, that may not be feasible. So I think one of the things is all of us, all printed circuit board fabricators, will publish a set of capabilities. But what's missing in those capabilities is how different things interact with each other. Yes, I can do all of this, but while I'm doing this, I may not be able to do something else. And I think that you only get an understanding of that if you have an ongoing dialogue with your fabricator. So I think the VIA structures are also very, very important. In fact, in our RF book, one of the things that we spend time on is really referring to VIA structures and how VIA structures can impact, how VIA structures plating can impact the end result of what you get on a part. And I think that part is obviously very, very critical. I mean, in terms of Ultra HDI today, So let's be frank about this, right? Ultra HDI has actually been around for many, many, many years. It has primarily been in the chip scale packaging world, and it's primarily being done out of Asia. So Asia has been doing Ultra HDI for many, many, many years, but we've had very little, if any, capabilities in North America. I mean, there... People in North America were talking about HDI technology, I want to say almost 20 years ago. And the last time they talked about it, it was with respect to chip scale packaging. And ultimately, it all ended up going to Taiwan and China. This time around, there's a lot of talk that people are really serious about doing it in the U.S. So I think that's a very positive sign myself. I think in terms of designs, right? I mean, we have today successfully build 20 micron lines and spaces at American standard circuits. So just think about it, right? I mean, we are people that, at least in the U.S., typically talk about mills. And we're always talking about three mill line, three mill space, four mill line, four mill space. And, you know, one of my taglines is we're really going from the world of mills to the world of microns now. Because now we've started talking about 20 micron lines and spaces, 25 micron lines and spaces. So 
It's very interesting how the dialogue changes, but we certainly have that capability. And again, as you're starting to design those things, there are a number of different processes and methodologies can, that can help you get there. We have done it on a variety of different materials. So uh, we've done a lot of 25 micron lines and spaces on flex circuits, as an example. We are currently uh, in the process of building a multi-layer flex with, I would say, 25 micron lines and spaces today as we speak. We've got those on our manufacturing floor. Something that not a lot of people have actually managed to do so far. I mean, it, it sounds easy, but it's it's riddled with uh, a set of issues that we're kind of working through. So I think one of the key things, especially as the boards get more complex, is if you're a designer and you're looking for something, be willing to partner with your circuit board supplier to work with them on the R&D phase, you know, and be patient. Because sometimes we might tell you that, yeah, we think it's going to take us two months to do it, but unfortunately... One of the famous adages where you just don't know what you don't know comes to play sometimes, right? And so, I mean, we do, we do see some of that going on for sure as we are endeavoring on this really advanced technologies. I mean, we have made the commitment and we have made investments to get pieces of equipment to be able to manufacture that kind of technology. But just because we have equipment doesn't mean it's all done. I mean, there's a lot of process know-how that goes into this. And every design is unique. So I think one of the other things that we've seen is that, you know, you, you, you deal with different kinds of complexities. And what people don't realize sometimes is just because you've done one part number that's similar when you go to another design, sometimes there's just enough subtle differences that, that can throw you for a loop. So while it should be doable, sometimes it doesn't happen the first time around. This is one question that's been on my mind when I, not just uh, with uh, Ultra HDI, but with like establishing a new process or a new technology that, that you or your company or me or my, my company, my employer may want to do or employ. But the issue I see at hand is if I have a customer that wants me to design a widget, how would be the best way to go around in your opinion on to allow them to let me try this new technology on their design? Because most customers, they don't want you to experiment on anything new. They want you to deliver a, a producible product in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of money. And so trying to get someone or convince someone to partner up and say, hey, there's a, a new solution that allows me to be more efficient for you and you can design more complexity. And um, so, you know, from your perspective, from a, a, a supplier's point of view, how, how do you go about collaborating or what is it? Because, yeah, like I said, in my, in my previous employer, that was a, one of the biggest things is it's not so easily to adopt the newer technology because the end customer isn't willing to pay for you to change your process or to change it because they just want their widget designed from cradle to grave as quickly as possible and as cheap as possible. Yeah, so I think that's a very fair question, right? And what I would say is that you should only use the newer technologies when you have to. And so what do I mean by that? If you can do it in standard technology, you should, because that usually would be the cheapest and the best way to do it, right? And that's the tried and tested method. But what's going on right now with the advancement of electronics, with the miniatur miniaturization, with a lot of the things that are happening in the electronic space right now, people are getting to the point that they can't do it with standard technology, so then what really as a designer you need to be aware of is what is the possibility? What are all the other technologies available that could help me solution a particular problem, right? If you start using ultra small ball grid arrays, well, you're not going to be able to route it out in normal technology. You're going to need the 25 micron lines in space. You might need 20 micron lines in spaces. So you let the end requirements drive the need for applying the technology as opposed to the reverse, right? Not try to push the technology out. We as a initiator of some of this newer technology, we need to make people aware of the technology. We need to make people aware of the capabilities of that technology. And then ultimately, as designers get to the point that they don't have an option, then they at least know, okay, here's my out. Here's how I can do this. I guess you know, my normal guidelines were 75 micron lines and spaces, but uh, there's no way for me to route these components out with that kind of design constraint. So I need to go get to that next level. 
And then once you have to do it because of the application you're in, so you might have space constraints, you might have size constraints, you might have whatever your design constraints are for your end product, that's gonna force you into the new technology. Once it does that, people don't have a choice, right? You either get that capability or you don't, right? And in order to get it, you gotta employ this new technology. But I think trying to convince somebody, well, let's go use this new technology because it's new, I don't think really works. That's kind of my opinion. I, I take a more pragmatic approach to that, you know, and I always, I mean, in general, from an R&D perspective, we at ASC, we usually let our customers drive what we spend our R&D dollars on because I think we don't want to be the people really pushing it. We want to be the people that are being pushed, for lack of a better word right? But I would tell you that Ultra HDI is the exception to the rule where we did get into it before there was the push and before there were a lot of people talking about it. And albeit our progress was relatively slow, we are really picking up right now because there is that demand out there. There are more and more people starting to see it. There are more and more people getting educated about it. And then a lot of these people want to source that product in North America, so that set of circumstances has made the ultra HDI conversation or has actually revived the ultra HDI conversation in North America. With these new technologies, you know, or I should say new, but with these technologies, the advanced technologies of flex, rigid flex and HDI and, and you know, ultra HDI, what do you see are the roadblocks to implementing these best practices you talked about? For me, when I always think of roadblocks of implementing anything within a company, the very first thing I think of is internal culture. Are they open to change? Are they open to accepting something new? Or are they going to stay within their swim lane or their legacy way of doing things? But what do you see as a roadblock from your point of view? I think that the biggest roadblock is whether ultimately people need these newer technologies, right? I mean, as long as they don't need it, they shouldn't spend their time on it. I mean, the biggest roadblocks, in my opinion, are A, we need to get more people educated on the possibilities. And then we need to look at them where they come up against the wall on the design that they are working on. Once you come up against the wall, that's when the roadblock goes down automatically because you don't really have a choice, right? So I I think the, the roadblock definitely is the fact that, you know, the technology is newer for people. So it's new to individual designers because they've never designed in it. So the mindset that you talk about is clearly there. I mean, it's interesting, right? So like 20 years ago, if you go back, right? The military and their printed circuit board requirements, they were always a laggard, right? They never wanted to lead in technology. If you remember, they always want to try, true, and test the technology. But, you know, with all the stuff that they're trying to do right now, they figured out that they actually have to now get to the leading edge of it as opposed to be on the trailing edge of technology because otherwise they're not going to be able to accomplish what they need to because things... Electronics is just getting so, I mean, it's just in the middle of everything, right? And more and more and more, right? I mean, you think about even something as simple as a a pilot's helmet and look at how sophisticated and how expensive a pilot helmet can be for some of these, the latest generation of fighter planes. I mean, just think about the amount of electronics, the amount of stuff that's going into it. That just shows you there's a great example of an organization or an industry, really, that that really wanted to be at very established technology. Certainly, I would call them a little bit established to trailing versus leading, has now migrated their thinking process. And again, the reason is why? Because they had to. I agree. I, with my background in avionics in the Marine Corps and knowing the complexities that go into these aircrafts, whether it's in the aircraft or the helmet or a communication system that's on their body, whatever the case may be, it, it's amazing. I do know from my experience in the mill aero, especially like on the commercial side, safety is paramount. And, and you're designing in the sweet spot of producibility and true known technology, and you're not pushing the envelope. But as you stated, as the complexity of our electronics in the industry are growing vastly in Things are getting smaller, things are getting faster, and having to be able to deal with that, you know, you've got to adapt the new technologies in order to be able to take it to the next level and to meet those customer requirements that you're talking about to design that widget. And I love the fact that you said 
that it's those end requirements that drive you into using these advanced type technologies, whether it's Flex, Rigiflex, you know, HDI, and then Ultra HDI. As we think about these roadblocks and, and overcoming them, I mean, you've already stated how some of these people can overcome these roadblocks. I mean, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, but I mean, you, you, you nailed it. With that said, you know, I think we've outlined the best practices when it comes to advanced designs. I can't thank you enough for your invaluable insight and sharing today on the podcast. With that said, you know, I want to thank you and, and uh, thank you for joining. Any last comment that you'd like to add? Yeah, I want to thank you for this discussion. I think it's been very useful. Uh, I hope a lot of people listen to it. As my final parting thought, if you're a designer, make sure you involve your fabricator. We're going to uh, publish the links as part of the podcast so that way the, the audience can, can get to those uh, educational content as well as your website and, and have a look see at you guys, okay? With that said, you know, we've outlined the best practices when it comes to advanced designs. You know, I want to thank Ana again for his invaluable insight. So keep following along uh, for more PCB design best practices. 